you have your Bibles with you this evening, open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. And if you're able, please stand out of respect to the reading of the Word of God. John chapter 5, we'll begin reading at verse 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that were, was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed, and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterwards Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. May God add his blessing. To the reading of his word, let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Speak to us from it this evening, and we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus had healed a man who had an infirmity of some sort, verses before tell us, for 38 years. He had stayed by the pool of Bethesda in hopes he might be cured of his physical problems. <coughs> He'd actually kind of camped out there for some time, even slept there. When Jesus came along and told him to rise and take up his bed and walk, well, he listened to what Jesus said. And verse 9 says, Immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. He literally was healed instantly. What he did next wouldn't be a problem to most of us, hopefully none of us, but some Jews made it into a problem because Jesus had healed him, God forbid, on the Sabbath. The problem was, after he was healed, he took up his bed, as Jesus instructed him to do, and carried it. Now, don't think he was sleeping on a queen-size bed there by... Uh, the pool beside his bed was simply a little flexible mat that the poor used and slept on you could roll it up and carry it under your arm very easily because it was so light but to a pharisee <coughs> carrying it was considered work. Jeremiah 17, 21 said, Bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it by the gates of Jerusalem. So they got on this guy for carrying his bed, which the thing wouldn't have even come close to weighing as much as a sleeping bag today weighs. And they accused him of bearing burdens on the Sabbath. Well, he says, well, wait a minute. 
I'm only doing it because the fellow that healed me told me to do it. And if I'm desecrating the Sabbath, it's only because this fellow who claims to be Lord of the Sabbath told me to do it. Folks, if man says one thing and Jesus says another, you better go with Jesus every time. Every time. You know, all these years now of preaching, I've had some strange things said or done to me or whatever. I've actually had people accuse me of not keeping the Sabbath because I preach on Sunday. While there are others that don't think preaching is work at all, but trust me, it is. They taught us in Bible college that if you really put yourself into preaching a sermon, it was like working eight hours. I believe it, because after I preach twice on Sunday, I'm tired Sunday night. I know I've worked, and I really know I've worked, especially since I've been dealing with this cancer. As a matter of fact, when I go home tonight, I'll be exhausted, pretty much. But I do it because the Lord of the Sabbath has called me to preach his word on the Sabbath, our Sabbath, and I'm not going to stop doing what he has called me to do because somebody thinks I'm working on Sunday. But, you know, no matter who you are or what you're doing, there are always going to be nitpickers who accuse you falsely. And there are some still today around that would even make the Pharisees look like liberals. I mean, there are some folk around that would make the Pharisees look like liberals. Well, let's go back to the healed guy. Verse 14 says, Jesus caught up to him later in the temple. Now, make sure you get that. He didn't heal him at the temple, but he found him at the temple. You know, it's not odd to run into somebody in church if Jesus has really touched him, is it? Uh, if you claim Jesus has touched you and made you whole, and this is for everybody that will listen to this on YouTube, if somebody has to twist your arm and keep after you to get you into church, I think you better get touched again. Something is wrong if you're supposed to love Jesus, but you have no time for his church. Something's very wrong there. Well, this fellow later tells them that if Jesus, it was Jesus that made him whole, and see how ridiculous things are, that causes them to want to kill Jesus. Imagine, simply because he healed this guy on the Sabbath. Verse 16 says, well, that's the story. You've heard it many times, I'm sure. But it's the words Jesus speaks to him in the temple that I really want to zero in on this evening. Jesus says to him in verse 14, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, he already knew he'd been made whole because he could now walk. He couldn't do that before. But he needed to hear that second part. And everybody that Jesus touches needs to hear that. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. From here on in, no longer continue to sin is what Jesus was telling him. And that's what Jesus says to everybody that he has made whole. No exceptions. 
And he wouldn't command us to do that uh, if we couldn't do it in, our, in his strength. And he wouldn't require it from that guy, from one person, while he let the rest of us get away by continuing in sin. For living above sin is God's plan and desire for all of us. That's what this is all about. Church, cross, Jesus, everything. It's all so we can live above sin. It's God's desire for us. Matthew 121, the angel says to Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What kind of savior would Jesus be if he couldn't save us from our sins? Now follow this. Jesus seems to imply that this fellow's 38 years of sickness might have been the result of his own sin and folly when he says, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. You know, our sin and folly can bring things upon us. For instance, who do you have to blame but yourself if you end up with lung cancer after you smoke for 50 years? I mean, think about that. I know a guy right now that needs a lung transplant, but they won't give it to him because he won't quit smoking. Even though he knows he's going to die and, and, and what have you, but he just won't quit smoking. So sometimes what we do, our sin can bring stuff on us. Our parents' sin can also bring things on us, sickness and the like. I worked as a night watchman while I was going to Bible college at a hospital in Colorado Springs. And I don't know how many little babies I saw brought from the maternity ward into the emergency room because they were born addicted to either heroin or cocaine because their mother took it while they were carrying the little baby. That little baby hardly had a chance. I mean, think about your parents bringing something on you. You're born addicted to, to heroin. Uh, but all sickness, of course, isn't the result of our foolishness and sin, or is it the result of our parents' sin? Sometimes you'll hear somebody claim that it is. But Jesus made that clear that it's not in John 1, 1 through 3, where it says, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Amen. Truth is, godly people get sick. Truth is, forget what some of those TV evangelists say, they don't all get healed either. And it certainly isn't always because they don't have enough faith either. Now, it can be, but it's certainly not always the case. But if Jesus sets you free from some sin, going back to that sin, according to Jesus, can cause even worse things to come upon you than before you were saved. And believe me, there are worse things than being sin, being sick or crippled. A lot worse things. Now, 
I was thinking the other day, it's amazing how much better you get to know the devil after you get saved. I don't think I really even realized that he existed before I got saved. But it's amazing how much better you get to know him after you get saved. We're often much more aware of his presence after Jesus sets us free from our sins. Matter of fact, the devil won't, won't trouble you much if you'll remain his servant. Uh, it's only if you want to leave. Then the devil's resistance begins. What do you do if your dog breaks its chain and gets loose? You get a stronger chain, don't you? Now, of course, now Peter will call you a criminal if you put a chain on a dog. I don't know if you're still allowed to do that or not. You're not allowed to do that. But I remember growing up, everybody's dog was out back with a chain on it. And if it got loose, you put a stronger chain on it if it broke the chain. Uh, in the same way, if Jesus breaks sin's chain that held you captive, you'd better watch your step. And stay close to Jesus. Because if you don't, and the devil gets a hold on you again, next time he'll use a stronger chain. And even with Jesus' help, it won't be as easy to break loose from sin as it was that first time. A worse thing can and will come upon you. And what will happen is the devil will guard you closer. It's dangerous to go back to sin if Jesus sets you free from it. Not only be, will you become a backslider, but once you've backslid... You are no longer saved and on your way to heaven. If Jesus sets you free from pornography or alcohol or cursing or drugs or lying or, or from whatever sin you want to put in there and now you're back at it again, well, don't think you're still saved from sin. You're not. As 2 Peter 2.22 says, you are like a cleaned up pig that got back into the mud again. Or a dog that returned to its vomit of sin. If you become a backslider into sin again, well, you go back to being lost again and don't be surprised if that time or this time you get meaner more selfish and deeper into sin than you ever were before you see it's very common for backsliders to end up in worse shape than they were before they ever heard of jesus 2 Peter 2.20 says that if Jesus sets us free from sin and we get entangled again in it, the latter end is worse than the beginning. And Hebrews 10.26-27 20, says, <coughs> For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment. The devil enjoys nothing more than getting a hold again on someone that Jesus set free from sin and dragging them back down deeper this time into sin. 
He's especially proud if that person is a preacher or a Sunday school teacher or a gospel singer or even an usher at church or whatever. The higher up, the better. Now turn over to Luke chapter 11 in your, in your Bibles. And listen as I read what Jesus taught here. Luke 11, we'll begin reading at verse 24. Jesus said, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, meaning the spirit. And finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Jesus cleans a person up. Then goeth he and taketh to him even seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there, and then get this, this is the kicker right here. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Now, I'm sure there's probably not anybody here that hasn't somewhere heard me preach on that before. But I don't think a lot of people take that serious enough. Dealing with one demon is bad enough. But if you leave the door open for him to return, Jesus says when he does, he will bring with him seven other spirits who are more wicked than what he is. And if you thought one of them was hard to deal with, Dealing with seven will be seven times harder. That's what Jesus means when he says, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. You see, if Jesus has set you free from sin, he wants you to stay free from sin. But you must avail yourself of the things that will help you to stay free. And we're hearing people all the time today that think all they have to do is go forward somewhere and pray with somebody or pray in front of their television or, or whatever it is and pray the sinner's prayer and then everything's fine and dandy and they don't have anything to worry about. Well, that's just where it starts. When that happens, then you better get into your Bible. You better start reading it and studying it and start obeying what it says if you want to stay free from sin. You better learn what it is to start praying. And you better pray a lot. And don't miss church. Anybody, I'm, not, I'm preaching to the choir here tonight, but anybody listening on YouTube that if you think you can be a Christian and stay away from church, you are dreaming. Uh, don't miss church. You need to be at church every time possible because here's where strength and fellow Christians are going to be found. And absolutely... If Jesus has set you free from something, you need to get rid of the devil's things in your house, whatever they are. If he sets you free from booze, that needs to go. If he sets you free from dope, that needs to go. Get it out of there. Whatever the devil's stuff is, get rid of it. And most definitely... Once that happens, you need to go on and get sanctified or filled with the Holy Spirit. But even people that do all that 
can backslide if they don't guard their heart. But it's a lot easier to live a life of victory over sin if you allow the Holy Spirit to fill your heart with his love and his power and if you do the things that are going to keep you in line with God, like studying your Bible and coming to church and praying and, and doing the things that you know you need to do. To every person that he sets free from their sins, Jesus says this, Follow me, be my disciple, and sin no more. This command wasn't just for this guy to sin no more. You will hear him say it to you too if you listen. In John 8, 11, you'll remember a woman was brought to Jesus caught in the act of adultery. And they wanted to stone her. You all remember what Jesus said to her. Same thing. Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Quit it. Start down a different path. Stop that. Put a halt to your sin. That woman was a prostitute. Jesus didn't tell her, okay, you're fine and dandy, go on and go back to being a prostitute. No. No. Whatever it is, if Jesus gets a hold of you, he sets you free from that. And you have to quit doing whatever it was that he supposedly set you free from. Or how can you say he set me free from it? If I go right back to doing it. And that's exactly what he says to all of us that he is forgiven and set free from our sin. And it's for our own good that he tells us this. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. For hear me, it will be worse if knowing what any of you here this evening know if you decide to go back to sin, it's not going to be nice. It'll be worse and worse for you. And if you ever think you need to get back to God again, it'll be seven times harder to get back to God. You just don't go back and, and go out and backslide and, and do your thing and then decide, well, I'll get back to Jesus one spirit, if it's gone, will bring seven back. And they'll build a fortress, and it'll be that much harder for you to set free, be set free. I've known countless individuals that Jesus set them free. Just like that, they were able to quit drinking or, or quit cigarettes or quit dope or, or put down the pornography or, or, or whatever it was. And then for whatever stupid reason, they went back and did it again. And then, man, it was very, very hard. It wasn't as easy to say goodbye to it the second time as it was the first time. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. For it will be worse if we go back into sin. May God help us never, ever to follow that path back. Let's stand. And if there's someone listening by YouTube this evening and you once knew what it meant to be saved from your sins, but you went back. I'm sure you would bear out the truth, testify that it's harder now to try to get back 
But I'm saying to you, it's not impossible. Jesus can reclaim you. Jesus can get you back. But you better get down to business, the business of really being sincere about what you're doing. Dangerous to be a backslider. So don't ever allow yourself to become the one. Let's join together in a closing word of prayer. Paul, would you please dismiss us? Prayer.